We hope that something uh, said or done helps to grow and uplift your spirit. Dear merciful Father in heaven, we come before you now as a congregation and as a family, hoping, dear Heavenly Father, that the praises we send up will be well-pleasing in thy sight. Father God, we thank you for the protection and the guidance that you provided for us all through this week to get us to this destination. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for these blessings. We ask you to continue to be with us. Please be with the man of God who brings your word today, dear Heavenly Father. Lay upon him your hands of grace and mercy, dear Heavenly Father, and allow him to dispense your word in a manner that all of us can know and understand. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you continue to be with us, guide us, bless us, and keep us from any hurt, harm, or danger. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning again, light of the world. What a blessing it is to be here today. Can we give God a hand clap of praise and thanksgiving? Well, we thank God for, um, most of all, for God's presence uh, because we know that God's presence makes the difference in our lives. And uh, we thank God for each and every one of you who are physically present here today, those who are joining with us online. We just thank God for each and every one of you. And, um, and we have assembled together in this place today with the express purpose and intent of honoring God, giving God glory and offering God worship because God is worthy. And we, we are thankful just for the opportunity to join in together and, and praise and worship God together. And so we're going to start out uh, in song by acknowledging that our God is holy. And so we ask you and encourage you to join in with us as we lift our voices. Holy, holy, holy. and voices with us. Shall rise to, to 
as a trinity. Come on, say it one more time with us. Say holy, say serve is holy. Um, God is holy. God is righteous. And there are numerous accounts uh, in, in the word of God when people encountered God, um, their, their response, their initial response was just falling down on their face. Uh, some shrieked back in fear and some just had to, had to uh, cover their eyes because of the glory of God, because God is just that holy. And God knows that if it's up to us, we in and of ourselves can live up to the standard uh, of God's holiness because our, our righteousness before him is just it's like filthy rags, right? But we thank God that God has given us his son. We thank God for Jesus. Uh, not only do we thank God for Jesus, we thank God for the word of God, whereby we can uh, go to for instruction and direction and uh, we can ask God to order our steps amen in his word so that we can live in accordance with uh, with who God is right and so we're going to ask that as we prepare our hearts this morning to receive a word we're going to ask God to order our steps so light of the world we ask that you join in with us and lift our hearts and voices Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Just send your anointing, Father, I pray. Order my steps in your word, please. Order my steps in your word. Acceptable in thy sight. 
take charge of my thoughts, God will day and night order my steps in your word. Please order my steps in your word. Now lift your voice and say, order, say, order my steps in your word. in your word, please order my steps in your, say I want to walk.
steps. No, we need you, we need you to order. So we can't live without you, God. We need you, Lord, to order our steps. Order, please order my steps in your world. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Come on and put those hands together like they're on fire. He tells us to order our steps, but he tells us how to do it. He tells us to do it in his word. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go to his word so we'll know how to order our steps. If you have a copy of God's word and feel so disposed, we ask that you turn to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 9, I don't know if we have it, uh, is that, Kevlin, is that King James Version that we're reading? Which version is it? You, do you have King James? Oh, you have to redo it? That's okay. Don't, don't redo it. Don't, I don't want you to have to redo it. I, I'll go ahead and read from my version. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, you'll find these words. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold and their faces resemble human faces. Their hair was like a women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. You may be seated in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, I want to talk to you this morning just for a little while. And I want to encourage you to change before it's too late. Change before it's too late. Because Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to judge the world. And if your name and if my name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, 
we will spend eternity in a, a fire of hell. To give you a larger literary context of what's going on, John is on the Isle of Patmos, banished because of his proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first four chapters, he talks about, chapter one, that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Then in chapters two and three, he, he talks about these seven churches and these seven angels with seven candles. And, and he brings critique to bear on them because they needed to change before it was too late. In chapter four, he talks about the universality of judgment. Then when he gets to chapter five through 22, his analysis is not historical, but it's prophetic. And not only is it prophetic, but it is apocalyptic. When something is uh, historical, it is something that happens within time and space. If it's prophetic, it is something that will happen within time and space, but it is something that speaks to the future. So uh, prophetic literature is futuristic literature. You can expect it to happen within time and space, within human history. But not only is it historical and prophetic, but it is apocalyptic and Apocalyptic literature is similar to prophetic literature with at least two or three caveats. One caveat is, is that it, it has some strange metaphors and imagery in it. Stuff with several horns and several heads and some spooky tales and long teeth, stuff that's coming up out of the abyss, things that are flying above their head. It's, it's apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature, also another caveat, is that not only does it speak to the future, but it speaks to events beyond human history. It's, it's after the angel of the Lord has sounded his trumpet and places one foot on the land and the other on the sea and sounds his trumpet and declares time is no more. It speaks to events that are beyond human history. They are apocalyptic. But then apocalyptic literature has a third caveat. It's coded language so that the people who are under great persecution can communicate with one another without the enemy knowing what they are communicating. It's kind of like they got a, their own language. They got a secret way of communicating what it is that they needed to communicate. Y'all remember that when the slaves got ready to to head north and they were getting the other slaves ready, they, they would sing Wade in the water. God is going to trouble the water. What they were saying is, is that we're going to meet by the river. We're going to get in the river and we're going to wade in it. And God is going to trouble it. He's going to be with us and guide us to the promised land. But then down in the swamplands of Louisiana, we had a language too. It was called Pig Latin. Oh yeah, it pay guga. Add nuga. Yeah, yes. You speak Pit Latin, oh nay, oh nuga. We had our own language so we can go. And Brad was back here quoting me like, he, he, won't, he just gonna take my sermon. 
but people from Louisiana, we know how to talk to each other without other people understanding what we are saying. So the book of Revelation is similar to that in that it is apocalyptic. And then five through seven, they, he's dealing with who's worthy to open the book. And then he says in seven that there's a, there's a number, 144,000, but he was speaking of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the Jehovah Witnesses say that that's, that's, that's the number that's going to heaven, 144,000. But I, I would encourage them to keep reading <laughs> because they stopped in the middle of the chapter. The Bible says that was another number that no man can number. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I want to be in that, that number. I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number. Then by the time we get to chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, we, we see there's a season of preparation. We read on further down in 8, 7 through 13, we see there is desolation. Then by the time we get to our text, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, we see, we see liberation. But before we see liberation, that has to be some, 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 some changes in our behavior. Revelation chapter 9 describes two hideous, two horrific, two monstrous, two horrific armies that are liberated just in, at the right time and they are permitted to judge humankind. The first army is from the, from the pit, if you're taking notes, and the pit is the bottomless pit. And this is literally the, piss, the pit from the abyss, the pit from the abyss. If you were to read the gospel according uh, to St. Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 31, you will find in that chapter that uh, in this pit is where demons live. Now, I know every now and then demons get inside of people, but they live in the abyss. They live in this pit, according to Luke chapter 8, verse 31. And then in the book of Revelation, John says, almost toward the end in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, he says, he says this pit is where Satan, is temporarily imprisoned. This is not his final uh, imprisonment, but this is where he is being held. So when you go to jail, they have a holding cell, and then you go to get arraigned, and after you're arraigned before the judge, then the judge decides if you're going down to Huntsville. That's prison. But Satan is not, is not in prison now. He's, he's in the holding cell. He's in the pit. Also, if you need more scripture, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 7. And then in Revelation chapter 17, verse number 8. This is the pit where the Antichrist will ascend. The Antichrist, the Antichrist is that that. that that Christ that is not the Christ, but he's the Antichrist. He's antagonistic toward the Christ, and he appears to be the Christ. He can even perform uh, certain miracles. And so some of these people go into these churches, and, and uh, they believe that these uh, preachers got miraculous powers and they believe that they have the powers of, of Christ and the holy apostles, but the Bible says that they are the anti-Christ. You ought to be careful where you go to church. You ought to be careful what you watch on TV. Revelation says that the antichrist will ascend. Now remember, this is not the lake of fire because that's Satan's final prison and, and all that follow him. 
Revelation 20 and verse 10. Now, this, this fallen star, back in, we're back in chapter 9, verse 1. This fallen star in verse 1 is a person. This person is very likely an earthly king. And uh, this king is over, uh, or this, 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 uh, well, this, this uh, supernatural king is over the beings in the pit. And this person does not have complete authority because the key had not been given to him before uh, he could loose his army. Now watch this now. He doesn't have complete authority because Jesus has to give him power. You understand? So it, God had to arrange it and allow him to do what he was doing. So he doesn't have absolute authority over you or me. This star is probably Satan and the army, his demons. And if you want to read about his demons, I don't have time to deal with that. But you can read Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10, and read the following verses. Ephesians 6, 10, following verses. But remember today that one of the names for Satan is Lucifer. Lucifer, 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 Lucifer. He was one of the archangels. You had, you had Gabriel who would go and communicate to people. That was one of the archangels. Then you had Michael when God got mad and wanted to take somebody out, he sent Michael. Yeah, yeah. Even the Bible says in the book of Jude that when, when Moses died that Michael and Satan fought over Moses' body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. And he wanted the praise that belonged to God. Because he wanted the praise that belonged to God, God kicked him out of heaven. I'm in Revelation chapter 12. Kicked him out of heaven and with his tail, he took one third of the stars. And I don't mean no harm, but Satan is still taking out God's stars with his tail I wish I had help in here God kicked him out and that's why we always say him above us to God be the glory because we don't want to sin like Lucifer and take the glory that belongs to God He's also compared, according to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Satan is also compared to the morning star. I write that down, the morning star. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 18, he said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Now when the pit was open, I'm in verse 2 now, chapter 9, Smoke came out as though the door of, of a furnace uh, had been opened in verse number two. And remember, Jesus compared hell to a furnace of fire. Jesus did this, if you take a notes, that's in Matthew chapter 13, verse number 42. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 50. He compares hell to a furnace of fire. Now, this is an image that ought to get people to stop, look, and listen. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do this morning. Stop, look, and listen. I started to entitle the sermon that, but it wouldn't scare you. <laughs> stop, look, and listen. Stop what you are doing wrong. Look into God's word and listen. For his instructions. Then there's smoke from the pit. It is one. Polluted. It polluted the air. Amen. Number two. It darkened the sun. Sounds like our uh, weather. In, in parts of the world. Now this is bad. This is really bad. But what's worse. Is what came out of the smoke. I'm down in number verse three now. An army of demons. Compared to locusts. The eighth plague in Egypt, for those of us who are at midweek Bible study, we know that the eighth plague in Egypt was a devastating swarm of locusts. 
I'm over in Exodus chapter 10, verses 11, uh, uh, verses 1 through 20, rather. And y'all uh, know what locusts do. They devour harvests. Deuteronomy 28, uh, 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 28, 38. We also in verse 32, you can also read over in Joel chapter 2 that uh, locusts devour harvest. Now, some of us, as you know, we, we preach from this pulpit that you ought to tithe. You ought to sow uh, a seed into ministry. And if the ministry has good soil, you plant good seed, then you wait on your season. Right? You got, you got a seed, what you give, your gift, your talents, your time, your, 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 ten, your talent, your time, that's your seed. You plant it in a good soil, light of the world, church of Christ. Then you wait for your season. And then you reap your harvest. And some of y'all are saying, well, I've given my seed, time, talent, intent, and I plant it in a good soil. And when is my season going to come? Well, your season may not ever come because you got sin in your life. Because sin can prevent your season from coming and God has sent locusts and the canker worm to eat up your harvest. Every time you get a dime, some breaks in your house. Every time you save a little, uh, car breaks down, child gets sick, something happens. You got, you got a seed, you got, you got, you got, you got soil, and you got a season coming, but you got to remove the sin. Uh, I'm right anyway. I'm right anyway. Now, these are not literal locusts, as we know, because locusts do not have scarping-like stings in their tails. Furthermore, these creatures do not eat green vegetation. In fact, they are pro prohibited from doing so. They are only given permission to torment those who, do, who, who are not protected by the seal of God. That's back in Revelation chapter 7, if you taken notes, verse number 3. Then I'm back over 9, verse 5. They were, to only, they were only to be tormented, uh, or if you want to know what tormented means, they were to be judged. Uh, critique was being brought to bear. They were judged for five Months. Do you know why they were judged for five months? I'm glad you asked. Because the normal lifespan for a locust is five months. May through September. The locusts also will sting people and create pain. Brothers and sisters, and the pain will be so excruciating that people will literally die. Verse number six. But death will flee from them. Revelation chapter, not, Re not Revelation, but Jeremiah chapter eight, verse number three. Death will flee from them. Now, let's go back to Revelation 9, verses 7 through 10. And these verses should not, uh, are not, uh, spirit, should be not spiritualized. Some people spiritualize and then they tell spiritual lies. But the symbols should not be spiritualized, nor interpret them uh, or not interpret it in light of modern means of warfare. John is a leaping image upon image to force us to feel the horror of judgment. Verse number 11. Now, according to Proverbs chapter 30, I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures, but you, you got to, you, you, how, you know, how, how you know what you got to do? 
Say amen if you like these scriptures. Amen. All right. I just want you to know this is not coming from me. It's coming from God's word. Proverbs 30, verse 27. The Bible says, real locusts don't have a king. But his army follows the rule of Satan. The angel of the bottomless pit. His name is not only Lucifer, but his name is Destroyer. Anybody ever read John 10 and 10 where it says, Satan cometh not, the thief cometh not, but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a destroyer. Real locusts are destroyers. But this army not only tortures those who do not belong to the Lord, but as God's people, we better be thankful that Jesus Christ, who I feel like shouting, Jesus Christ holds the keys. He holds the keys. According to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 18, he holds the keys to hell, death, and the grave. Good God Almighty. And he exercises divine authority over the enemy. The army comes from the east. Chapter 9, verse 13 through 21. Here we, uh, we here now just dealt with the first woe. Now, somebody's asking, Dr. Seamster, what is a woe? What is a woe? Why don't you woe right there and tell us what a woe is? This is, where, this is, this is the only way I know how to explain a woe. Because I ain't smart enough to tell you what a woe is, but let me, try to, let me try to explain a woe. Think about the worst thing that's ever happened in your life. Are you thinking? The very worst thing that has ever happened in your life multiplied by 1,000 and that's a woe. And this is just the first woe. Mm, the first woe. That was the fifth trumpet which is a part of the judgment of God. Now, let's deal with the second woe. Second woe, you already know what a woe is. But it's multiple woes. You've been through hell and high water. They're like, you were saying, God, going to take me from here. That was just the first woe. Now God has another woe. Look at the woe, second woe. Sixth trumpet is the second woe. We looked at the seven seals. We've studied that in Bible class. And now we're looking at here are seven trumpets, and within the seven trumpets, there are three woes. Y'all know that. I've taught that. And we're on the second woe, which deals with the judgment of God. And not only does it deal with the judgment of God, but in the midst of all of this, God is trying to get you and me. God is trying to get us to repent. Now we have to understand that the Lord is not slack. God is not slow concerning his promise. And some men count slackness, but he is long and suffering toward us. Okay, y'all don't know that scripture? You do know this one. Second Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any should what? Perish, but should, but all should do what? Come to what? Repentance. So anytime somebody repents, turn around. Not a 360. This is a 360. That means you turn around and start walking in the same direction that you were going before. Talking about I'm going to make a 360. No. No, no, no. Where were you in calculus? Is that the right of geometry? That's one of, it's one of them. 
You miss one of them classes, I know. Not a three. Sixty, but a one eighty. And you walk away from the stuff you were doing before. You say, Lord, the stuff I used to do, I ain't going to do no more. Mm. But Dr. Seamster, won't God forgive you? Yes, for that sin. Y'all doing the same thing and asking God to forgive you for the same thing? Yeah, he'll forgive you, but he'll forgive you for another thing. Y'all mean to tell me you ain't got but one sin? Hmm. You got to repent. So any, so any time somebody repents, gives their life to Christ and they're baptized, Acts 2.38 says their sins are forgiven. Don't you just love that? He'll forgive you. Forgive you for all of them. So God is not willing that any should perish. So in the midst of these judgments, it is an attempt to get humanity to change their minds about Jesus Christ and be saved. God is seeking the repentance of humanity, and that's what's so scary. Some of us think that revelation is scary. That's why some of us don't read it. Some preachers won't read it because they're afraid of it. Some of us are in here this morning. And we're afraid. But the Bible tells us that there's a blessing associated with reading it. You need a blessing. All you need to do is read Revelation because a, a blessing is concomitant with reading it. It comes with it. It goes along with it. It's concomitant. It, it goes together. So when you start talking about fire and brimstone and hell and all that, we get scared. But really, it's a blessing. But the scary part is, after all that fire and brimstone and all of that hell and all of the, the locusts and the stinging and the demons, and all of the smoke and the sun won't shine. There's cataclysmic destruction. What's sad is we still won't repent. God will is that we repent. But after all these woes, people still won't repent. When I get through preaching, some of y'all going to sit right where you are when I finish. And I can't hardly stand up, but I'm holding on so I can tell you because it's important that you hear it. That's scary to me, which causes me to ask you, what is it in your life that God has been judging? What is it in your life that God has been trying to get you to turn from? And he's brought this judgment after this judgment. He's brought this woe after this woe and another woe. Then even after all of that, you still won't repent. That's scary to me. Brothers and sisters, what does it take to get a person to turn from their evil ways? I just... Uh, just a few, I was uh, in New York for Dr. Uh, Eugene Lawson's funeral and some people got stuck on the elevator and they were on their way down and the elevator dropped a few floors while they were on it. And they got them off the elevator, they didn't fall all the way down to the bottom but they just fell a few floors and they got them off the elevator and the people were beaten, bruised and battered and they were finally rescued and they interviewed one of the men and uh, one man and he said uh, the, the, the jerk, the stop caused them to all fall to their knees 
and to be driven to the floor. I wonder, brothers and sisters, what does it take to get some of us to our knees? Does it take for us to be beaten and battered and bruised? Does it take for God to throw us down? What does it take? God is sending these woes and judgments out. That he might drive someone to their knees. One woe after another. Now, I'm almost finished. Verses 13 and 14, we find the prevention of the, the wrath. So if something is going to be loose, then of course it had to be bound. There was something that God was preventing from happening. God has held some stuff back off of our lives. As a matter of fact, when it opened up in verse 1, God gave those demons permission to attack the people on earth. But he said, those that have the seal by God, he said, leave them alone. But with this sixth trumpet, this second woe, I believe that this is just for those who have not repented. Because he said in verse 20, even those men who were not killed, they still have not repented. He's not addressing those that have repented. He's addressing those that have not repented. Now, why did they refuse to repent? In verse number 20, because verse 20 says they worship the devil. Romans 1, 23 says they worship inanimate objects. They are worshiping stuff that they made with their hands. Cities and church buildings and companies and made with their hands. God says, but you're serving and worshiping gods that cannot see and gods that cannot hear and gods that cannot walk. I don't know about you, but I need a God that can see. I need a God that can see my pain this morning. I need a God that can, can, can see the effort uh, and, and the energy uh, and the sacrifices and see that what I'm up against. I want a God that can see that I'm tired and weary. I want a God that can see. But I also need a God that can hear. I need a God that can walk because I, I don't want to stay in the same place. You know what they were serving gods that they made. No, no, no. No, no. I need a God that can make me. They were serving gods that they could pick up. But I need a God that can pick me up and turn me around. Turn me upside down in order to turn me right side up. They were serving gods that they could purchase. No, no, no. I need a God that has already purchased me with the blood of his dear son. You've heard now the word of God. Do you believe it? Are you willing to repent? Confess that he's the Christ so you can get the seal. But you don't get the seal until you're baptized. Then God will prevent some things from happening to you. Then if you sin, if you fall short and you mess up, which we all do, all you got to do is repent, change, tell God, I'm sorry, I'm going to get it right with you. Because I don't want to have to deal with the second and third woe. If you're already a member of the Lord's church and just need prayer that you don't, that you're ready for whatever comes at you, I want you to know that we serve a God that will cover us. He will send an angel to watch over you. 
And all of us are living in slippery times. Everybody falling. Preachers are falling. Church leaders are falling. Members are falling. Politicians are falling. Everybody falling. Because of why? We're, we're living in slippery times. But on Christ, the solid rock I stay in, all other ground is sinking sand. You're living in a slippery situation, stand on Christ. He's solid. He's solid. Stop depending on your money and your job and your spouse and your children and your house and your education and all of that. And who you know, stand on Christ. Yes, sir. I wish I had something else to give you. I wish I had something else to give you, but I'm giving you the best thing I know. And that's Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We're ready to sing, Brother Pew. And I know somebody is ready to repent. But if don't nobody moves, I just want to just ask God to forgive me. Anything I've done or said. Whether it be a sin of omission, I didn't do what he asked me to do. Commission, I did something that he didn't want me to do. Or disposition, I didn't have the right attitude about doing it or not doing it. Ask God, I'm going to start with myself. Help me to be more patient. Help me, to, help me to love like you loved us. Not like I love. I love, but I, don't, I, don't, I know I don't love like you love. I need to love like you love. Not to forgive like you forgive. I got to seek the Father's will like you seek the Father's will. You, you left the best example, so I want to follow that example. In Jesus' name, amen. The preacher has repented. Anybody else? We got one other. I don't know if they're here to repent, but they, they've come, so we're going to sing. Anybody wants to come, you can come right now, even as together we stand, sing song of encouragement. Oh, oh, oh love lifted me. Yes, he did. Love lifted me. Go ahead, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. and when nothing else could Come on, now come on, come on, come on, come on, come on and sing. Come on, come on. I know his love. You may be seated. Dead. You still can come. Oh, and I know that when, when nothing, 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 n
me Cause you don't know what he's done for me And I know he gave me the victory Oh, and that's why could have We have several precious souls that have responded to the Savior's invitation. And we thank God for them. We have a card from Brother Marshall Bro. He says, I would like to repent. I need to turn away from uh, all of the sin in my life. I need strength to move in the direction that God would have me to go. I need to love more the way that he loved me. I'm okay, but I'm not there yet. God bless you, Brother Bro. What a beautiful card. God bless you. And then we have a card from Sister Janet Bashir. She simply says, I confess my sins. God bless you, Mama. And then we have a, a card here from Sister Savala. I want to love like you, God. I want to love my family, my friends, and everyone. God bless you as well, Sister Savala. We have a card here from Sister Jacqueline. Cobb, she says, Lord, please help me for myself. I have sinned. Help me. I ask God to forgive me. God bless you, Sister Cobb. Then we have a card from Sister Belinda May. She says, I repent for all of my sins, and I ask the Lord to forgive me, and we'll be praying to that end that God will forgive you of all of your sins. Then we have a card from Sister Brenda, Brenda Crawford. She says, then I solicit the prayers of the church for my husband, Fred, and Robert, my uh, son-in-law, and the rest of my family, and that God will extend unto me traveling grace. We'll be happy to do that, Sister Crawford. And finally, we have a card from Sister Venetia Cathy. She confesses the sins, and she solicits the prayers of the church. And we're going to bow right now and pray for these precious souls that have come and, um, and turn it all over to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you because we know that you are God and beside you there is no other. Father, we ask you that you forgive us of all of our sins as we confess them before you and these men and women of God. Father, we ask that you will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. 
so that we'll never see our sins again. But wash us afresh in the blood of your Son that we'll be pure and as white as snow. Father, help us to move onward and upward to higher and holier ground. Help us to serve you and only you. Be with Sister Kathy. Bless Sister Crawford and her family, her husband and her son-in-law and her children. Be with Sister Belinda May. Perform a miracle in her life. Be in Sister Cobb's life. Forgive of all her sins. Help Sister Stavala to love the way that you love. We ask that you be with Sister Bashir. Poke her with the finger of your love. Strengthen her where she's weak. Build her up where she's been torn down. Be with Brother Marshall Bro. Help him to be more like you, Father. Forgive him of all of his sins. And then, Father, I ask that you be with me. Cast my sins into the sea of forgiveness and remember them no more. Help me to be the kind of example that you would have me to be so that my members would obey you as I obey you. That I might be an example and these other leaders might be an example to the people that we've been given stewardship for and leadership over. Help us, Father, to do that with dignity, with integrity, with honesty, with consistency. Help us to be faithful, Father. Help us to be students of your word. Help us to put those things we've studied into practice so that people can see that you are in us and that we are in you. And now, Father, we pray for those who should have come but for some reason did not have the courage nor the faith. If it be your will, give them another chance before it's everlasting and eternally too late. But for now, we ask that you bless us, bless the effort. We'll be so mindful and careful to give you and only you the praise, the honor, and the glory. This we ask in the name that's above every other name. If we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't thank you enough, but we thank you that you loved us and now we love you back this we ask in your name in Jesus name amen thank God you may return to your seats knowing that our God not only hears but our God answers all of our prayers Can we give God a hand clap of praise for that mighty word? We thank God for our pastor. We're going to prepare this time to commune, and as the brothers prepare, uh, we're going to lift a song um, in preparation for that. So please join us. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Say, here I am. To 
to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that You're my God and you're all also I deliver unto you that the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he in thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup saying that this cup is the new testament of my blood do ye this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me you show the Lord's death till he come Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we come before you now, giving thanks for your son's precious broken body that hung, bled, and died on the cross for our sins. Father God, we ask that all those who partake of this bread and this cup do so with clean hands and clean hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That all who have repented of their sins and who have accepted Jesus Christ as the personal Savior and Lord and are in fellowship with his church partake of your communion elements at this time. is a portion that represents the whole. The principle of tithing goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 14 and is sustained throughout the Bible. Giving the tithe is an act of faith, love, sacrifice, and obedience. This principle is so important that God himself says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, test me in this. When we offer God the tithe, we give God room to bless the 90. And remember, we give to God because God first gave to us. There are three ways you can give electronically. You can give online at the church's website. You can give via your own banking institution, or you can text the word tithes, T-I-T-H-E-S, to the church's phone number. 
And if you're physically in service, you can drop your offering envelope in the offering box as you exit the building. You may give at this time. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for these tithes and offerings that have been collected, Father God. We ask that you allow us to use these funds and these means in a manner well-pleasing in thy sight, in a manner that will bring others to you and show them that Christ is the one and truly way. Father God, we ask that you continue to be with this family, continue to be with those who have, been, have administration over these funds, dear Heavenly Father. Continue to watch over and guide them and allow them to make great decisions. Father God, we thank you ever so much for these blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Can we offer God one more hand clap of praise? It's been a blessing to be here this morning, and we're grateful to God. Uh, listen, we want to keep before you that the um, our 23rd church anniversary is right around the corner. Uh, we will be celebrating on August the 7th. And uh, for those who haven't seen the announcements, um, there will be a breakfast that will begin at 8 a.m. It'll go from 8 a.m. until 8.45 a.m. Um, you can sign up. We're asking if you would, please, if you want to attend that breakfast, please sign up at the reception desk so that we can get a head count and have an, uh, a good idea of how many to prepare for. So that will start from 8 a.m. to 8.45. And then um, at 9 a.m., we will begin a musical prelude here in the sanctuary with none other than the LWCC Adult Choir and our own praise team. So we're just gonna, we're gonna spend some time offering God praise and thanking God for bringing us this far. Amen, because we know we couldn't come this far without God. Amen, somebody. Yeah, and so we're just gonna take some time and, and praise God and thank God for bringing us to this point. And, and then after that, uh, service will begin uh, around 10.15, okay? Around 10.15, we'll start service. And that Sunday, uh, none other than Brother Darren Smith will be bringing a, an electrifying word. Uh, so we're looking forward to what God is placing in him to share with us as we celebrate 23 years of ministry. And we thank God for each and every year. We thank God for every mountaintop. We thank God for every valley. But we're thankful that God has been bringing us through. Amen. And I, I would be remiss if we just didn't just give God some praise right now for the angel of this house, amen, who God has used to help lead us and navigate us through uh, some rocky terrain. But God has been faithful and God has uh, given him strength and foresight and vision. And uh, we're thankful to God for his service and his commitment to the kingdom of God. And so we're looking forward to, to celebrating with you. We're asking you, invite somebody, bring someone with you. We're going to open up the balcony. We'll make sure we're going to stay safe. But we want to uh, just have a wonderful time celebrating our God and celebrating 23 years. We're going to go ahead and prepare to dismiss. And we're going to ask that uh, you would adhere to the usher's instructions as they will dismiss us in an orderly fashion. You can dismiss out of this door to my left. And uh, please, please be sure to um, put your name down on the list if you want to attend that breakfast on August 7th. So let's bow. Let's close out in a word of prayer. God, our Father, we thank you again and we honor you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we were able to gather together to worship and praise you and to glorify you, to just thank you for all you've done, to hear a word from you, Father. It's our prayer, God, that we would allow that word to take root in our hearts and that we would, uh, that word would bring forth much fruit, Father, that we, as your people, God, will turn away from those things that keep us from you and that we would turn toward you, Father God. God, we ask that you would continue to bless the angel of this house, continue to keep him, continue, oh God, to... Um, pour into him all that's needed day in and day out. 
as he serves your people. And Father, as we leave this place, allow your light to shine in us so that men and women might see how great and wonderful you are and their hearts might be turned towards you. We love you and honor you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.